I always disliked and distrusted studies of architectural types, if only because they seemed to begin with the obvious and end with the obvious. At the same time, it never seemed that the word type was used consistently from study to study. Sometimes the author would mean a category, at other times a function. Even worse, a standard of appearance. In other words, a study of type would mean that you could never compare anything, never cross-check anything, never hold anyone accountable. In other words, type studies were the refuge of scoundrels who wanted to avoid accountability. And here I am, doing a type study of the Tempietto. Well, you can tell from the subtitle that this won't be a typical type study. I'm out to critique the whole idea of type by using terms and methods drawn from archaeology, mathematics, psychoanalysis, and even magic. I want to demonstrate a principle that you might find useful even if you aren't interested in types. This is the fact that, no matter what point you pick to study in the universe, it's connected to all the other points. And if you have the time and energy, you will get around to talking about everything. If this is true, then you have to be careful to pick a point that is near some others that offer good results, so that your project of explaining everything gets off to a good start, and who knows, maybe you can knock off early. This is to say, before the 500,000 years it will take to cover about 100 points and do a good job. I just counted up all the ideas, special terms, important examples, books, films, philosophers, mathematicians, psychologists, etc., etc., I want to recommend to you. It's 157. That's a lot, so I won't be talking about any of them in detail. I'll just show you the list. The first is a set of terms I need to know pretty well. How they work, what they do, who writes about them. This set has to do with the construction of visual experience and a few terms thrown in to cover how weird perspective really is. You also need objects, meaning works of art that you can return to and ponder. These should be things that always tell you something new about the world. I have been using these for over 30 years and I am still learning things. The key is that if something attracts very smart people, you should take a look. You'll be mixing in the right crowd. I like scholars who are methodological and consistent, but imaginative. Harold Bloom's early critical work seems to have been more inspiring to other people than it was to him. For example, he didn't seem to realize that his six terms paired off to make three groups. Also, Eschesis is about the architecture of retreat and contraction, whereas Demon is about the wilderness. Henry Johnstone was still teaching when I was a grad student in geography at Penn State. He was wondering why a geographer was interested in philosophy. We also had a common interest in operas and jokes. He worked on the idea of travel in the 80s when he went back to get a second doctorate in classics. While reading Homer, he realized that travel had its own rules and regulations and his list was a fascinating balance between exercising too much control and too little. I recommend you take a look at this, but you'll have to go to my website to do it. Architecture covers a lot of territory. Again, I use the principle of what people who I think are smart like to talk about, not the popular ones, just the clever ones. Not all of them are in architecture, in the case of some of these lists, architecture doesn't even know anything about them. Some of these lists are wish lists, but everything here is something I've worked on, and I hope you can find something interesting. You become clever by the topics you think about. Standard topics lead to a standard mentality. The same applies to sources. Standard thinkers lead to mediocre thoughts. Tough thinkers make you think, and the point is not to follow them, but to do as they do. Pick the best, and you will always feel engaged and be at your best.
Don't rule out fiction. It tells you a lot, and novels written in Roman times are just as complex and exciting as those written today. And don't forget the classics, such as Don Quixote. In the two hours it takes to watch most films, you can not only get a complex plot, but understand how architecture and landscapes can tell stories and how stories can be truer than day-to-day -day reality. When I started to get into mathematics, I found a wonderful set of videos on a site called Numberphile. They are for dummies like me who never made it past calculus. Believe me, there are some critical things we have to learn. Now for me, this involved projective geometry and fluid dynamics. You may have heard about the French psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan. His writing is very difficult, but in the 26 seminars he wrote up every year, all of them available in English, and in collections of his essays, he is completely consistent. Architecture doesn't have a good model of the human subject. Hard to realize, I know, but we fail to theorize the subject in all its complexity or take into account its slow development. Lacan also depended on geometry to explain the subject, which is why you need to know all about topology. Each of these topics interlock and can be drawn on paper. Because Lacan was an extremely visual thinker, more architects should be interested. So far, there are only about 12. As far as academic groups go, Lacanians are friendly and open. It's possible to meet the people whose books you admire. I haven't met Will Greenshields because he's teaching in China, or Aaron Schuster because he's in Holland at the moment. But the others are not only available, they're nice people. As a grad student in geography, I got into John Battista Vico, an 18th century Neapolitan who, like Lacan, mistrusted Descartes but thought we should take him seriously. There are only a few architects interested in Lacan, and even fewer interested in Vico. I'm interested in the way Vico and Lacan intersect. So far, I'm the only one. Just me and a few friends. Believe it or not, every item on this list is critical for architecture. In fact, the person who virtually invented projective geometry, the basis of topology, was an architect, Girard Desargues. A fellow from Virginia Tech wrote a dissertation on him in the 1980s but he thought Desargues was a rogue responsible for the Industrial Revolution and didn't get into Desargues' perspective theory. Projective geometry is based on theorems of Pappus of Alexandria, which you can learn how to draw. The idea behind projective geometry is that things are produced by cuts, not molds. The cut is 2D. It produces surfaces that are self-intersecting and non-oriented, like the Mobius band. After Desargues and Pascal developed the theorems of Pappus, they were run out of town. Uh, well, actually, Pascal died, rather young. The 19th century, however, rediscovered them, and for the whole of the 1800s, if you were a mathematician, you did projective geometry. Came quantum mechanics. So after 1900, no one called it topology anymore. I argue that you don't have to be a mathematician like Gauss, Mobius, or Klein to understand topology. Because the logic of projective geometry actually comes from cultural practices. This is especially evident if you look at the work of ethnographers such as René Girard and Van Gennep or Marcel Mauss. My favorite is Ernst Cassirer, a rival of Heidegger's who got messed up by World War II because he was Jewish. Heidegger became a Nazi, but he is currently architecture's favorite. If Heidegger had written about topology, I would have had to swallow hard and read him. But that's not the case. Let me begin to say something about why topology is important. Here's a famous engraving by Goya called The Sleep of Reason Produces Monsters. That makes it sound like reason is the reason we don't have nightmares. But here's another interpretation. Reason is not consistent or complete. It cannot account for itself. Reason needs to sleep to survive. 
And when it sleeps, it must dream about the negative, the monster, in order to heal its self-inflicted wounds. It happens to be true that, because mathematicians did not like to deal with negative quantities in the 1500s, they couldn't solve the problem of cubic equations. The solution, discovered by a group including Cardano, Del Ferro, and Pacioli, involved putting the equation asleep, then adding an imaginary number, like the square root of 3, then subtracting it after the work was complete. Remember that the square root of a negative number involves a fiction, a plus or minus i. That plus or minus is like inducing a coma in someone who, if left awake, would die. You put them to sleep, the body cures, you save the appearances, then you wake them up. This idea already existed in architecture from the very beginning. It's the model of the Tower of Babel and its derivatives. The idea is that a period of confusion can be made into a component, usually involving disconnected loops that accumulate anxiety and, in effect, draw off the toxins of Euclidean space-time until a point where the labyrinth gives way to the temple. The temple is like plus or minus i. By being a residual of rationality, it is able to detoxify and cure. Forget about symbolism. The temple and labyrinth don't mean anything. They do things and are like cures of the disease we call sense perception. Of course, we are continually reinfecting ourselves because we create histories and struggles where architecture takes on the role of labyrinths and temples. These two forms are really the same thing, just with different uses and motives. This is the first lesson of the Tempietto. Shadows can tell time and predict death. Think of the classic Western movie about a duel, High Noon, the time of the shortest shadow. To relate the temple labyrinth idea to the Tempietto, the actual topic of my lecture, I have to rework Desarc's perspective ideas to emphasize the fact of elevation. If we don't stand up, we can't see anything. Worms and bugs don't see in perspective because they never get off the ground. When we stand up, the horizon stands up with us. And without going up in rockets, the optical horizon is the same as the Earth's. There's still a horizon in outer space, but it becomes theoretical. Still, this drawing applies. All of the terms I use to talk about ethnological topology come from this diagram. Desargues' point was that the space we see is actual, not an illusion, that the structure of this space is also a structure of time that becomes the time of human interactions and cultural formations to shape those interactions. These involve bringing things at infinity within conceptual and graphic reach, just as Zisarg found a way to draw perspectives without having vanishing points fall off the drawing board. The point is that, if we draw Desargues' model correctly, we find that the points, lines, and planes all tell stories, and that all the stories ever told find their place in this single drawing. Once we can relate the parts of this drawing to the 2-4 deal of the temple and labyrinth, we have a handle on the way we construct the spaces and times we live in. Different cultures do this in different ways, but don't try to explain this as a matter of conditioning. They all make different choices at critical moments in language. Desargues diagrams will seem ridiculous unless you realize how, every day, you find yourself in some relation that proves them true. <laughs> 
When we look at a shadow of a group of buildings behind us, projected onto the face of buildings in front of us, we have a profile that we are seeing in reverse, as if the space behind us has suddenly jumped up in front of us, making a sandwich out of our visual space. The profile has reversed, but it makes us aware that we have reversed in looking away from it onto a projective surface, where the two profiles compete like rivals, one enjoying the favor of the sun, the other cast into doubt by shadow. But one thing all cultures have in common is an understanding of what Northrop Fry called the lapidary imagination. Stones would seem to be dead, but they have an uncanny way of being alive. You can sometimes sense this in landforms, as in the film The Power of the Dog, where Benedict Cumberbatch's character understands the anamorphic meaning of a nearby mountain range. In the crystal, which is the rock's way of saying it's alive, we sometimes find analogs of living things like cells, limbs, cities, chambers, observation towers, prisons, and temples. After all, crystal balls look into the future, so we know about their ability to represent the idea of fate and fortune. When we look at crystals, it's like a ready-made architecture that wouldn't take much to form into a city or a story about a city. There's the idea of a modular held in place by rules, some kind of government. The angles and projections all seem to make sense. The spaces and shadows they create in between all tell their own stories. The shapes intersect yet maintain a constant logic. Sometimes crystals seem to grow organically in the same way plants or jellyfish give us an order that is both weirdly non-human and intimate and attractive. You almost want to eat some of them. These photos were made, by the way, in the New Mexico Natural History Museum in Albuquerque. It's almost impossible to make an ugly photo of a crystal. They are nature's most photogenic creation. They also don't seem to mind to be photoshopped. Almost anything you do to manipulate the color spectrum seems to be welcomed by the crystal itself, which offers a different side of its personality every time you change the hue, contrast, or bandwidth. It seems like every change of light tells a different story turns a prison into a refuge, a labyrinth into a temple. So no wonder there was a crystal at the top of Egyptian pyramids. They represented a constant that was capable of infinite permutation, a relation of nothing to everything. You would enjoy the books of John Michel, such as A View Over Atlantis, on the subject. My mathematician friends tell me his calculations are quite correct. It would seem that rocks are the most passive things in the universe. They don't have feelings. You can crush them, melt them, blow them up without feeling too guilty. But this extreme passivity has a secret that is revealed by the crystal's way of making us think that not only is it alive, but it knows something important. This must have been at the back of the heads of the people who dragged the huge monoliths of Stonehenge from their sources to the site on the Salisbury Plain. Lacan says that Aristotle messed up the fourth cause, material cause, on account of not understanding passivity. Now this is a real connection, a psychoanalyst saying something about crystals and the relation of crystals to standing up and looking around. There is another term currently hated by architectural theorists, instrumental causality. This is the way that doing something out of free will sets in motion forces that are connected in crystalline ways that out of our choices construct something quite different. The Virginia Tech guy who wrote about this arg hated instrumental causality 
because it created history. He didn't like the history, but he was right about how this passive causality worked and how effective it was. So good for him. To get on the right side of instrumental causality, take a look at the way the lapidary imagination gives us things we can understand in the context of dreams and stories. In the film The Wizard of Oz from the 1930s, a girl living in Kansas runs away from home, returns just at the moment her family have retreated to an underground storm shelter because a tornado is approaching. She goes into the empty house, but the storm has loosened the window frame and it hits her on the head, causing a concussion. In her delirium dream, she meets figures who are people she knew on the farm, but were transformed into magical beings. Together, they try to find out what they are missing. In this one movie, you can find things to correspond to every one of the 157 items on my list. This is the fastest way I know to learn about everything you want to know about architecture, psychoanalysis, and topology. Even the most famous song from the movie, Over the Rainbow, is about saving the appearances and the need to induce a coma to cure the body of the disease of reason. The Emerald City gives Dorothy and her magical friends a way of getting inside the crystal to see the rainbow from the other side. They do a desarg, so to speak, with shadows and projections. They connect everything with a logic of lack. And so the model of the department store, which is based on the lack of things we didn't even know we lacked, comes into play. One of my favorites, the Kadoui in Berlin, will allow me to introduce the idea of parapraxis, which is, technically speaking, the way metonymy is used as a map and interior plan, stretching our lack through an interior architecture of desire, constructing fantasies as a labyrinth to maximize our encounters with buying opportunities. People who design department stores seem to know all about crystals and all about the ethnological topology of rising and falling. In the Alfred Hitchcock movie Vertigo, we have the eternal theme of life, love, and death put in the form of a tower. Dare I call it a tempietto? If it walks like a tempietto and quacks like a tempietto, I say it is a tempietto. Yet no architecture critic has written about the instrumental cause of this film or its lapidary imagination. Yet at the end of the film, the key to the mystery is a jewel, a ruby this time, rather than an emerald. That would have been just too good to be true. If I can connect Kadawi with vertigo and explain consumer behavior in relation to the crystal, you can too. One list I didn't mention is one of the most important, since it shows us how the polythetic set, another name for the lapidary imagination, works by framing narratives in relation to the double and its relation to the cut. This is the 2-4 deal I promised you, multiplied, or rather squared. What is a polythetic set? It is a set that can reproduce itself and maintain its form, even though elements are lost, suppressed, or missing. It's an idea that comes from structural archaeology, but it works in topological ethnology because the set is always splitting itself in two to create new and unique perspectives, a kind of anywhere, anytime. In this set of story designs, the double theme reproduces itself to show different sides, just like a crystal reflects different colors when you rotate it. This magic crystal 
has saved a young girl's life. It is a pharmacon, meaning both a cure and a poison. Because to cure Dorothy, it had to simulate death. Dorothy performed what is the most universal cultural travel idea, the descent into Hades. Don't get too alarmed by this. The word Hades is Greek for the invisible. So whenever you see Desargue talking about projecting the invisible onto a surface, we are doing a catabasis, a descent into hell. Desargue will also tell you that descent is always echoed by ascent, and the tower formalizes ascent by erecting something that is symmetrical, like the crystal, and even making a big deal out of telling the story out of its growth from the earth with columns, which seem to yearn to be topped by something that relates to the infinity of the stars. This tower can be found in Turo Park in Newport, Rhode Island. The thing you need to know about Newport is that the Elizabethans who began to colonize the country that became the United States thought that Newport would make a great capital city. It had a protected harbor, gave strategic access to the rest of New England, and was currently up for grabs. To establish your claim, you had to build something solid within a specified time period, and the stone tower was the effort of the crown to give a model for how to make the monument into something both symbolically impressive and materially useful. In general, Newportians have misidentified this tower. Some have called it a windmill, which makes no sense given how windmills have to function. Others have said that the Vikings built it, again, unlikely because Vikings would never be caught dead building such things. Only one guy, James Egan, a photographer turned archaeologist, patiently researched the time period indicated by the worked stones and mortar to uncover the tower's true function. The symmetry of the tower has to be deduced from what remains after the British, who had used it to store gunpowder, intentionally blew it up in the fall of 1776 as they retreated from the town they had held for three years. The roof and floors were blown away, so Egan had to deduce them from the openings and supports that survived the blast. Location was another source of clues, since the tower was locally a civic center, but regionally an observatory. I recommend that you read this book, not just to learn about the tower, because if Egan is correct, and I don't doubt that he is, this is the first and only Renaissance building in North America, designed by no less an intellectual superstar than John Dee, scientific advisor to Queen Elizabeth and general polymath. Egan not only presents all of the important evidence to prove this, he includes important clues about the geometric speculations of the time when the Tempietto was a spiritual mathematical exercise, a kind of AI machine. It was an architecture built to be interrogated. And like chat GPT, it made you think more than you thought you could think. Egan has stored all his dynamite in a small museum at the side of Turo Park, and he will talk to you anytime he's there about the tower. The hearth location is key to the tower's other functions. Egan discovered that the tower worked as a camera obscura, able to project images onto the wall opposite the harbor. At the key moment of sunset, on the day of the spring equinox, the sun, inverted of course, shone directly into the firebox with water above it. Notches and projections showed Egan where the floors were constructed, and he was able to derive the fundamental proportions of the original building. But it was the way openings in the wall allowed the tower to function as a celestial device, not only to establish it as a kind of geodesic monument, but to calculate key events, not just in the solar and lunar cycles, but in the seasonal circuits of key stars and planets.
Not every Tempietto works as well as the Turo Tower, but every Tempietto aspires, architecturally, to be a center of things where rituals take place to celebrate key dates. The logic of this polythetic set is that things can be missing or encoded, present in different forms. Astrological instruments were important in the 1500s because exploration required navigational skills dependent on the movements of the sun, moon, and stars. The camera obscura function was also a metaphor of the way the Tempietto was a giant cyclops, not just for the surveillance, but accurate measure of things happening on the horizon, where the observer's point was both a plane and a small hole, creating a hinge between the large world outside and the small world projected on the wall inside. This is Desargue all over again, although Desargue wouldn't be born for another hundred years. But because D and his geometer friends, among them Luca Pacioli, knew all about astrological numbers in relation to projection and the calculation of depth using instruments, we could move up the discovery date of projective geometry to the early 1500s and give D much of the credit. The inversion of the image in the camera obscura pointed to the hinge role of the monocular observer. This is the basis of projective geometry, where the horizon at infinity and the viewing point are equated and cross-functional. This principle had been explored before this. I think we could all regard Stonehenge and other hinges of the late Neolithic and Bronze Ages as the first cases of the Tempietto idea. From this point on, the idea that the horizon's vanishing points and the viewing point were mathematically the basis for a global theology were working in the background of all religious construction. The single eye doesn't mean that we lose binocularity and thus a sense of depth, as Jonathan Crary would have us believe. Rather, it is that there is another parallax to be had, a parallax inside the Euclidean one, so to speak, a one that is both a code and a keyhole. We look through a hole, it has to be just one hole, because we use looking to construct a hinge, a pivot. Dee was able to explain all this to Queen Elizabeth, who was no dummy herself, but quite an adventurous intellectual. At the time, predicting the success of things was uppermost in the minds of heads of state, who were contending for European dominance and exploiting newfound worlds abroad. It was a gambler's paradise, with all kinds of speculative schemes promising enormous fortunes. It was well worth Elizabeth's time to listen to Dee explain how a single building could make or break her chances of success in the new world. With navigation tied to such a momentous situation, the idea of instrumental convergence was literal. Instruments, actual ones used to measure things, were a part of a structure, a conspiracy of power and aspiration. This was also, very predictably, the time of the utopia, where the promise of the use of instruments to find things and calculate their value could be materialized as a new way of life, where people left on their own would naturally do the right thing. Dream on, you say. But even in Thomas More's version, the letter U stood for both a good place and no place. The idea of negation was put in a positive form, but the idea was that utopia was a place where the European mind had to be put to sleep in order to cure its ills. This pharmacon had to kill before it cured. All this was connected to the idea of the cube, thus incubation. This, the idea of a womb out in the landscape somewhere, preferably a place where virginity could be protected and the child of the utopian marriage could be identified as having just one father. This is where Dee's design took off. 
It provided a meeting space for important governmental rituals, a place to tell time using markers in the heavens, a place to demonstrate important annual events such as the equinox and solstice, and a place of knowledge condensed into emblems and cryptograms that embodied mathematical keys as well as philosophical relationships. Dee's Monas Hieroglyphica was, like other emblems of the day, derived from the idea that Egyptians and their hieroglyphs embodied esoteric wisdom. Egyptians were important, not just because they knew all about the lapidary imagination and built the first Tempietos full scale, as pyramids topped with crystals, but because their funerary practices suggested they also knew how to solve the mysteries of life and death. Death as a place where the soul wandered to find the truth. Europeans wandering to find a place for utopia was a version of this Egyptian idea, so they needed their own hieroglyphs. Egan has worked out the proportions of the meeting space. Also, a camera obscura, the library above it, and an upper room, he speculates, worked as an observatory and celestial map. The dome interior may have displayed the tracks of key stars and planets, with scales to gauge their relation to the Earth's annual calendar. Remember that the English were still using the Julian calendar while the rest of Europe was using the Gregorian. Actually, the ancient Greeks had used a more accurate way of calculating time, but the Mayans topped them all. No one, of course, knew about the Mayans. If remember the theory of humors was also a medical specification involving psychology and the logic of human behavior, we can see how it was the first paradigm of instrumental reason, how the body was also the mind. Taken to extremes, this was how the mind, as the model of free will choices, was one side of the coin that, on the other side, embodied the most passive thing anyone could imagine, a rock. This was not any rock, but the philosopher's stone. The crystal was an argument about this stone and about the structure of passivity. Remember that it is Lacan and Vico. These are the only ones in history to suggest that Aristotle revise his thinking about passivity and rework, out of materiality, a fifth cause. You would think architects would have some interest in this. It seems that architects may have had a lot of interest in it. It's just that our theory is not cupped up with it. Domes are not representations of the sky. They are instrumental locations where celestial events are idealized and brought within reach. So when Desargues says that the vanishing point where parallels converge is actually a place we can construct and reconfigure, we should perhaps take him more seriously. Take, for example, the three-part system of the Tempietto, which Egan has used to reconstruct what the D-Tower may have looked like. The three parts are critical, but they can seem to indicate different things. The Tower of Winds in Athens, long managed by Sufi mystics, divided the horizon into six parts, with a few openings here and there. Clearly, there were spaces for ceremonies and some of the functions of an observatory. In other Tempietos, the three-part structure is converted into a tower ringed by a colonnade, a minor variation. There is almost always a dome-horizon relationship, even when the Tower of the Winds makes the horizon into a sextile theory of the breadth of the world. This is a more interesting connection that we could explore in another video. In these famous 2 plus 1 models, the relation of ringship to kingship has the same idea of extending the power of the word to an edge that, in return, gives back prophecy. Prophecy is needed because nature has its own gaps and inconsistencies. The most important, perhaps, is the way some of the planets appear to run backwards during their annual transit, the idea of retrogression. When something goes bad on Earth, it's usually the retrogression of Mercury that gets blamed. This twist is entirely topological. 
It's called the Interior 8, and it's equivalent to the Mobius strip. The rule of projective topology is that all its forms combine the idea of self-intersection, which is a principle of a circuit that conserves energy and contains everything, with non-orientation. This combination calls for a double circuit, a circuit that moves in two directions at the same time. This is also a theory of how free will is shadowed by instrumental convergence. In history, the only place you will find this theorized is in Vico's work, although people like Spengler and Hegel get into it. In ideas of subjectivity, the only place is Lacan. I'm not trying to be an evangelical missionary here. I'm just saying that these original thinkers have something important to say because they try to theorize instrumental convergence and do a pretty good job. Sometimes architects get the right idea, but are not aware of the position of their idea in the history of ideas. Aldo Rossi was one such case, and here he adds the idea of motility to the tempietto, which doesn't destabilize it, but rather shows how stability depends on destabilization, a theater on a floating barge. When Rossi compared the theater to the anatomical theater in Padova, we have another element to add to the Tempietto's polythetic set. Now we can almost close the circle, or rather the double circuit, connecting astronomical observation with life and death issues. Architecture is a form of necromancy, a connection of the temple of the lapidary imagination with the labyrinth of material desiccation and decay. The idea that the body's momentum takes it past the moment of death into a journey that requires navigational aids. So the polythetic set grows some new branches, but the new ones confirm and restructure the existing ones so that we see just how universal the Tempietto is, just how perfectly it achieves a symmetry just at the moments when we think symmetry is impossible. It is up to theory to add to the list of literal things going on, a list of the general principles that allow us to find in all kinds of works of art, architecture, rituals, cultural practices, and even in mathematics and physics, the same structures, the same construction principles, the same roundabout projects in search of truth. We must even force ourselves to face the unexpected and resist the kind of captions that limit our understanding by using a logic of looks like rather than a logic of how things are structured. This doesn't ignore the local history of things as famous as Jeremy Bentham's Panopticon, but it forces us to look past Michel Foucault's monodirectional interpretation of crime and punishment. We use the polythetic set to cut forms apart and reassemble them, to see, for example, that there are two buildings in the classic theater form, a linear one and a circular one. The cut is not something we apply for analysis. It's something already built into the idea of the two forms as they are laminated together to produce another type. Types make types. They grow dynamically. They recombine to produce more resistant life forms to escape the death of obsolescence and misuse. We can do this on paper, but human use reconfigures and reimagines fixed forms by separating and joining circulation and views. I told you that we should be interested in fluid mechanics. I know you must have thought I was crazy. But this is really an ancient idea in architecture, where there are many kinds of flows that have the power to make many architectures out of one fixed form. I ran across this when I studied the case of Simonides, the poet who allegedly discovered the principle of artificial memory, really the first documented case of AI, by means of the topological flattening of a 3D banquet hall. The problem was that no one had connected memory with topology or the recombinant logic of chiasmus as a polythetic set. 
I doubt very much whether this will happen in the future, since it has been architecture theory that has rejected so much of what has happened in architecture history. To combine the panopticon with the theater seems preposterous, but it forces us to look at the function of the fourth wall, which becomes a big deal only later when cinema seems to do on a regular basis what war does as an extreme act, tearing off exterior walls so that interior rooms are left hanging out in space. Exposing something intimate as something public is a violence of its own account, just as the panopticon was more oppressive than a prison using torture and interrogation. Architecture teaches us that complex ideas can be mapped. Theory adds, if it knows anything about psychoanalysis, that these maps are parapraxis, that they are the trails left behind by signifiers across a material terrain that, at any scale, tells a story that ends with a temple, a stone, a jewel. This version is called the Mons Delectus and emphasizes the idea of free will as a labyrinth of choices, which labyrinths generally do not have. Ariadne's thread is for the purpose of indicating in and out, because the true Theseian labyrinth is a series of three folds that alternate between centrifugal and centripetal forces. Well, okay, some people know all about parapraxis. You have an example down the street, in fact. This is very much an observatory, ritual center, and a marker of power. Patrick Geddes proposed a system of outlook towers of knowledge that combined most of the Tempietto's possible features, except perhaps for the anatomical theater and panoptical prison. But the surviving example in Dundee still sports a camera obscura, now equipped with telescopes that can see all the way to Edinburgh. The Mercer Museum in Doylestown, Pennsylvania, houses the collection of the ceramicist and all-round eccentric Henry Mercer. The museum turns the tower into a diagonal labyrinth from primitive tools to sophisticated machines, ending in the terminus of a gallows. Quite an editorial conclusion. Tempietto holds out the promise of a shared universal language. So the Tower of Babel stands as probably the most famous and most ancient prototype, where the ambiguity about the top of the tower preserves the possibility that the tower succeeded in reaching the heavens, where language was what is called bi-univocally concordant, a one-to-one -one relation of word to thing, so that for things to exist, they have to have a name first to call them up into service for reality. Here is the labyrinth temple idea for the linguist and the theologian alike, where we don't know whether the temple was complete destroyed, or just invisible. I go for the invisible, since the idea of truth as being inside some cloud has always had an appeal ever since the WAC faculty promoted a book about ceilings and dreams. Although the Tower of Babel is the mega example, my personal favorite is the site now occupied by the famous Vatican Church complex. It turns out that the building preserves a bit of the idea of both the Tempietto building and universal language idea, but it is built on top of an even more important language site, the shrine of the god Vagetanus. Mothers of newborns would take their children in to an oracle who was able to translate the cries of the infants into prophecy. The idea was that the newborn was too young to have acquired any character or desires other than the basics, and so would be the most objective source of future truth. What I like is how the Vatican preserves the sounds of the crying baby in its name. Lacan says that the most important thing we say is in between what we think we want to say. In other words, the grunts and the sighs, the slight breaths, the coughs, the slips of the tongue, the mumbles and the bumbles. This is also the stuff of the Tempietto, where a universal language is sought. 
It's not Egyptian hieroglyphs, but instead the way we all mumble alike. Mumbling architecturally is the monotone of the labyrinth single passageway, whose only clue needs to be about whether one is going in or out. The alternating centrifugal and centripetal motions are all about the conservation of energy. We return to the idea that it takes two circuits to maintain this conservation, one that expands, another that contracts, the desire to escape, and the instrument that works to converge on the center where there is a monster. Ariadne's thread is thus the most useful tool for the entrant who is unlucky enough to stop in the middle of his trip and then forget where he was going. I think I should remember that I'm going out, out of this lecture, that is, uh, and tug on my Ariadne's thread and get out of here. Just a word in passing to remember Peter Shickley, a beloved comedian who re- and decomposed our favorite classical music so that, like the wailing babies of the god Vajitanus, we could hear a different music in between that went straight to our funny bone.